Maybe. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Dr. Kevin Doherty of MIT. Today, he's going to give a guest lecture on factor graph representations for hybrid perception problems. Uh, Kevin has done a lot of nice work uh, in the SLAM and uh, mapping and uh, even marine robotics. Um, I think that that's where you started. I remember your early works, right? So I remember Kevin from the time I was working on Gaussian processes mapping, and he did a really cool work. He put it on um, Octree data structure, and um, it was suddenly 3D and nice. So, um, and then from there, he's been just um, you know, releasing new interesting works every year. So looking forward to your talk, and I'll let you take it from here. Awesome. Thanks so much for the introduction, Mani. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is super cool to me just to, to be chatting with all of you today. Um, I'm getting a little bit of echo. I don't know if there's someone. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, so um, for this talk, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a broad overview of just my research work to date, just to like familiarize everyone with um, you know what I what my interests are, what what I work on, that kind of thing, uh, and then I'll do a deeper dive into some more technical stuff, uh, dealing with some of my recent work on uh, factor graph, what what I'm calling factor graph representations for hybrid perception problems. I'll go into all of you know what that means um, more specifically, uh, you know, in, in the context of the talk. Um, but just to to contextualize, uh, so my background, I did my bachelor's in electrical engineering at, at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, where I graduated in 2017. Uh, and then immediately went to, I came to MIT where uh, I was pursuing my PhD uh, jointly in the uh, MIT Aero Astro department. And then also as part of the Applied Ocean Science and Engineering department um, within the uh, joint program between uh, MIT and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, at MIT, I was part of the Marine Robotics Group, which is within uh, CSAIL, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, uh, working with Professor John Leonard there. Um, and uh, yeah, I also I should note I I just uh, I just defended my my PhD thesis this past December and I've uh, I've wrapped up at, at MIT now, um, so I'm, I'm officially no longer with with uh, MIT, um, but uh, broadly my research interests uh, kind of lie in the space of, of robot perception, estimation, navigation, uh, machine learning, and then also you know with application in uh, areas like field robotics and marine robotics, um, and then even going down into you know especially more recently mathematical foundations like um, you know, dealing with specific optimization problems or spectral graph theory as it appears in SLAM, um, which has been tied into some of my, my uh, most recent work. Um, so what I do now, uh, actually, as of uh, literally two days ago, um, I work on this robot, which is the Boston Dynamics Atlas. So uh, two days ago, I, I started at, at Boston Dynamics, um, where I'll be part of the um, Atlas research team working on um, you know, I, relatively similar problems to the ones that I thought about during my PhD, just in a very different context, um, dealing with things like uh, object-based robot perception and, and navigation, um, but more guided toward uh, doing complex uh, two-handed manipulation tasks. So I'm very excited to be, uh, to be getting started uh, there. And of course, if anyone has any questions uh, about any of this, uh, you can feel free to reach out to me uh, I am happy to share. Mani has my email information or things like that. If you want to share with the, you know, with the class, um, folks can reach out to me about any of this stuff. I'm I'm happy to talk about technical stuff. I'm happy to talk about career stuff. Um, anything at all, feel free to reach out. And then to give a little, a little bit more of a grounded uh, sort of overview of some of the research work that I've done. Um, while I was an undergrad at Stevens, I worked on uh, real-time predictive mapping for field robots, and this is some of the work that, that Bonnie was talking about, um, where we were really trying to deal with um, two, really two sorts of problems. First is in the marine setting, when we have uh, something like a sonar sensor where the data is particularly sparse and very noisy, uh, how do we build a coherent and, and ultimately useful uh, occupancy map from that you know, often tremendously noisy uh, data? And then the second problem, which is shown on the top here, is kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, which is um, how do you, similarly, uh, how do we build maps, but in this case, where uh, we have actually a tremendous amount of uh, LIDAR data. And in this case, the, the, the question really is, you know, how do you ensure that you can update your map quickly uh, as you're getting large quantities of data very quickly? Um, so this is like two ends of, very opposite ends of the, the sort of data spectrum. 
if you will, for, for these sorts of robots. And then uh, when I came to MIT and Woods Hole in 2017, I sort of sh uh, shifted gears toward working more on semantic representations for both uh, mapping and localization. And so this included things like object-based SLAM, uh, underwater terrain cl uh, classification, and things like anomaly detection for uh, marine robots. And then my most recent work, uh, sort of the last uh, couple of projects from my, from my PhD that I did, uh, I was working on uh, efficient inference techniques for what, what I would call more expressive and robust models for robot perception. Um, and this was building off of some of my earlier work on object-based SLAM. And this includes generally problems like uh, combining learning-based perception methods, like object detectors, right, with traditional geometric state estimation in the context of, of uh, navigation. This also includes things like how to mitigate outliers, and then uh, in, in maybe the most general case, how to deal with uh, discrete states of interest like contact. Uh, and then on the fundamental side, uh, or maybe what we might call like mathematical foundation side of things, uh, I've done a, a whole bunch of, of recent work on convex optimization techniques and spectral graph theory as they sort of connect to the estimation problems that appear in uh, SLAM and in robot perception more broadly. Um, for example, to, to establish formal performance guarantees on the quality of the estimates that we can provide in the context of SLAM. Uh, and then also to sort of leverage those ideas to develop new graph sparsification techniques for large scale SLAM. So as we you know, collect more and more measurements, uh, we want to ensure you know, time bounded SLAM performance and, um, and uh, memory bounded SLAM performance. Uh, we need to get rid of some data somehow. And, and so how can we maybe inform uh, a method that picks and chooses which measurements to keep around. And then in terms of like long-term research goals, uh, maybe to, to give sort of just a picture of you know, who I am as a researcher, I guess, I'm particularly interested in the perceptual algorithms and representations that we need to give real robots the ability to operate robustly over extended time horizons without human intervention. And so the, reason, the reasons why I, I care about this in particular, and again, this is not you know, uh, an exhaustive list, but, but three areas that, that I care particularly about are scientific exploration and monitoring, infrastructure inspection and maintenance, and things like sustainable food and agriculture. And I think in order to achieve some of the really important, or I would say some of the most important objectives in these spaces, we really need to be able to go beyond the small spatial and temporal operating scales, mapped environments, and frequent human intervention that sort of characterize the current state of the art in, in real robot deployments. And so that's a little bit about kind of my interests and like who I am. And like I said, if you're interested in any, any of this stuff, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, but specifically in the context of this talk, uh, I'm only going to discuss really one, one and a half uh, major projects, uh, which is dealing with inference and hybrid graphical models and connects some of the work that I've done on uh, robust perception and uh, semantic mapping. And this work was done in collaboration with some of my lab mates at MIT, David Baxter, Eddie Schneeweiss, uh, Zichi Liu, Curran Singh, and then of course my advisor when I was at MIT, John Leonard. So to kind of set this up, uh, my thesis work was really largely motivated by the following sort of problem. Uh, so let's suppose we have a, a robot that's just tasked with exploring a previously unmapped environment. And this could be something like a coral reef, like I have pictured here. And so in order to navigate, our robot needs to know, first of all, where is it in space relative to this environment, right? And then where is, where is all the stuff in the environment, of course? Um, and finally, it might be important for a robot to, some, to have some idea about what everything in its environment is, right? So maybe a robot needs to be able to identify different species of coral or different objects of interest in its environment. And it's easy to see how this sort of general problem setting could be adapted to more specific problems, right? Um, naturally, this captures applications and things like environmental monitoring, or maybe we want to assess the health of reefs, things like mine countermeasures where we want to detect and localize mines. Uh, infrastructure inspection, like in the case of aquaculture, where maybe we want to uh, detect specific changes or degradation. And this, of course, also shows up in important terrestrial applications like autonomous driving. A lot of us are you know, probably familiar with, with these types of, of applications at this point, uh, where you know, our autonomous cars need to be able to keep track of buildings and other cars and pedestrians in order to uh, get from A to B. 
And then uh, also in the case of something like a household robot, where we might want our robot to perform object-centric tasks, like washing the dishes, right? In order to wash the dishes, our robot needs to be able to like find the dishes in the first place. And mathematically, uh, we can formulate this problem as a particular type of uh, simultaneous localization and mapping or, or SLAM problem. And this specifically is the problem of inferring a robot's trajectory and a map of the environment from a set of measurements. And so we want to know a robot's trajectory. The look. Sorry, do we have a question? I think someone maybe just accidentally unmuted. Um, so in, in our case, we want to know the, our robot's trajectory, the locations of uh, a set of environmental landmarks, and then in our case, uh, the semantic class or category of each of these landmarks. And so this makes the problem what we would call in the business sem a semantic slam problem, just this addition of, of uh, classes or uh, categories of each object. And of course, because all of the measurements that our robots can make about these sorts of quantities are noisy, so maybe you know this could include things like camera images, inertial measurements obtained from accelerometers or gyroscopes, um, you know, whatever your robot happens to have access to, we specifically formulate this problem as one of Bayesian inference. And so given all these noisy measurements, we want to find the most probable set of robot states uh, and the most probable map. OK. So what actually makes this difficult? And I, I think that there are two things that I'm going to focus on in, in this particular talk. But obviously, you know, there are many challenges uh, broadly to, to doing all kinds of uh, navigation. But the, the two that I'm going to be interested in in the context of this talk are first, incorporating semantics in the context of uh, uh, geometric traditional, what I'll call traditional geometric estimation in SLAM. And this is tricky because predictions from learning-based models that we use to obtain semantic information, like object detectors, uh, can be unreliable in practice. And this is especially true when these models are deployed in settings that don't really match the training data that uh, they, ha they um, have available to them. And so here uh, on the right, we can see you know, one at the time state-of-the-art model uh, giving erratic predictions in what I think is a very reasonable situation. Um, so th here, this is YOLO from uh, a few years ago. I think this was like three years ago now. Probably a new state-of-the-art model would, would do much better. Um, but here, it's you know, this is just an off-the-shelf YOLO model uh, running on, on data from an iPhone um, and giving, I think, uh, pretty pretty wild predictions. You know, it predicts that the sofa is, is also a mouse. Um, it predicts that that a guitar is a, a person and so on and so forth. And I think what's interesting about this is that this isn't really an adversarial environment at all, right? This is just my old apartment. Um, so it seems like if we want to use these sorts of predictions from learned models in the context of navigation, we need to somehow reason about uncertainty, uh, however it's going to appear in these models. And this leads to the next important challenge, which is once something goes wrong, how do we deal with it? Right? Uh, how do we deal with outliers or incorrect data association that might arise from these sorts of errors? Um, because you know, if if you're willing to take me at my word for the fact that you know these models can be unreliable, or if you've maybe used them and experienced this in practice, um, we know that, that that this can be the case. Um, but uh, you know, even beyond that, these these models can also be ambiguous, even when they're performing well. Uh, so. For example, on the on the top right here, we have uh, two detections of cars, and you know I, I think I would say that that this model is clearly detecting cars, uh, but it's not actually clear from these bounding boxes, which are here depicted in green, which cars are being detected by this model. And so in this case, uh, data association, which is this establishing the correspondence between measurements that our robot makes and landmarks in the environment, is uh, challenging. And of course, if we want to use these techniques for a navigation system. Uh, if if our robot is is uh, trying to use cues like objects in the environment to detect whether or not it's in the same place that it's been in, in before, this can lead to catastrophic failures. And this is what we see exactly uh, appearing on the bottom right. Um, and here we have uh, just a uh, sort of sample example of a uh, a, a robot's trajectory uh, depicted in in green here, and a map uh, which is uh, depicted in in gray. And as we uh, add outlier measurements, which are these red lines, uh, what you can see is that there's significant distortion in the quality of the map that the robot is able to produce. And of course, if we want our robots to be able to determine things like outliers or, or data associations, uh, this requires solving a discrete estimation problem. And so this is, this is kind of important because both dealing with semantics 
and this problem of outlier rejection or, or data association involve reasoning about these sort of discrete sources of uncertainty or discrete sources of, of ambiguity. And so really the, the question that, that we sort of posed uh, in dealing with these kinds of challenges is, is how can we represent this coupling between discrete and continuous states? So first of all, how can we you know, model how discrete sources of uncertainty or discrete sources of ambiguity um, interact with the, the usual sort of continuous sources of uncertainty that are common to all kinds of uh, you know, sensors that we might traditionally use in a, in a navigation setting like your accelerometer um, or you know, uh, camera or LIDAR, et cetera. And so we'd like, to, we'd like to first of all be able to represent this, this sort of uh, coupling. Um, and then ultimately, uh, as I kind of alluded to before, find the most probable assignment to the uh, unknown states that we're interested in. And as I've kind of alluded to, a natural way to approach these problems is as maximization of the posterior probability of in, in this case, now we've, we've kind of observed a set of continuous variables, which I'll call C, and a set of discrete variables D, given a set of noisy measurements, uh, which I'm calling here Z. Uh, and I've already kind of uh, posed the semantic slam problem within this framework in a way, uh, where we have continuous states corresponding to our robot's trajectory and our landmark locations, and discrete states that correspond to um, the uh, semantic classes of, of landmarks. But also outlier rejection fits into this framework, where we have continuous states uh, corresponding to our robot's trajectory and discrete states indicating inlier or outlier uh, decisions about measurements, uh, as well as problems that involve um, discrete contact states like gate estimation. And uh, throughout the talk, I'll also, also uh, this will be useful to know, um, I'll use the color red to depict um, discrete states of interest and the color blue to depict continuous states of interest. So whenever there's an unknown state, like say a robot's pose, that would be a continuous state of interest, which would be in blue, and then a decision variable, like whether or not a measurement is an inlier or outlier uh, would be depicted in red. And you'll, you'll see that. And I'll call that out as it sort of um, appears as well. So that's clear. Okay. Uh, so given this sort of uh, formulation of, you know, we want to maximize the, the posterior probability of these continuous and, and discrete states given measurements, uh, how do we actually go about modeling that posterior distribution? Well, it turns out that a lot of these problems actually admit very elegant and concise descriptions in terms of hybrid factor graphs. And factor graphs, which I think maybe you've covered in, in class already, are uh, simply probabilistic graphical models that provide us with a flexible approach for constructing complex joint distributions from simpler components. And by hybrid, all I mean is that these are factor graphs that contain both continuous and discrete states of interest. And as I said here, I'm depicting those discrete states of interest in red and continuous states of interest in blue. And the measurements that a robot can make uh, or constraints, even uh, sort of um, uh, modeled constraints between variables uh, are depicted as these factors in black. And uh, so for example, this, this sort of first, uh, first case here on the top uh, is an example of what we might call a switching system where we're trying to track the motion of the continuous motion of um, a pedestrian in an image, say, uh, subject to some discrete decisions that they might make about whether to go left or right. This is maybe a little bit of a contrived example. Uh, but on the bottom, we have actually you know, a very, much more realistic uh, example of something that you might see in practice, where we're trying to estimate the trajectory of a robot given by the, these um, continuous variables corresponding to the, the robot's pose at different uh, points in time, linked maybe by some odometry measurements that the, the robot has access to. And our robot also makes these loop closures, but we might not trust that those loop closures are reliable. And so we introduce discrete variables that control whether or not we're going to treat um, those uh, measurements as inliers and keep them and use them for state estimation or you know, effectively discard them as, uh, as outliers. And ultimately, we'd like to perform joint uh, inference of all of these quantities in the factor graph simultaneously. And so unfortunately, even though uh, hybrid factor graphs give us this fairly expressive way of, of writing down some of these problems, the sort of common off-the-shelf tools that are used for solving continuous optimization problems defined in terms of factor graphs, like you might see uh, GTSAM or G2O or, or series, um, and, uh, haven't previously enabled solving these sorts of hybrid problems, at least not directly. Um, and so as a practitioner, 
you might be able to use an existing technique for a specific problem. So maybe you're dealing with uh, the problem of outlier rejection for which tons of existing solu uh, solutions are available. Uh, and you can you know, go on GitHub and, and clone a repository and you know, uh, you're, you're good to go. But if you don't have uh, a problem that fits nicely into the mold of, of some existing technique, you might end up trying to change your problem somehow by say transforming discrete states into continuous states just to use existing tools, which is obviously not desirable because now you're actually having to change something about your problem formulation just to use the tools that you have available to you, which seems a little bit backwards. Or in the, in the last case, you end up implementing your own ad hoc tools for a specific task, which is fine in the immediate context, right? Because at the end of the day, you can implement something that, that does what you need it to do. Um, but ultimately this leaves the next researcher or you know, next practitioner to hit the same roadblock. Um, and this is kind of the situation that I found myself in a few years ago. And so to give a little historical context and maybe to demonstrate that this motivation isn't like totally fabricated or contrived, uh, this is a real exchange uh, from the GTSAM uh, users Google group from back in 2020. And uh, I don't have the, the context from the original poster here, but um, the, the original post was asking essentially about whether it's possible to use uh, the tools in GTSAM for factor graphs containing both discrete and continuous variables. And here, Frank Dellert, who uh, some of you might be familiar with from, from Georgia Tech, uh, who is responsible for this uh, GTSAM uh, library, he's saying, yeah, you can mix any factor types you want using our, our uh, software, but we don't have any optimizers for this. And, and so if you can imagine me as a, a grad student you know, three years ago working on these sorts of um, semantic slam problems or object-based slam problems, uh, this really got me thinking, like how can we implement an optimizer using these tools that would be sort of relatively general purpose? Uh, because I, I was struggling with some of the issues that I mentioned on that previous slide. Um, and so wh why, uh, it's interesting to think about why there isn't really uh, good support for these types of models. Uh, and I think that, that one of the key reasons at least is that uh, it's particularly hard to identify a suitably general candidate for inference in these models. So even if we happen to be able to write down the, the sort of factor graph model for a switching system or for outlier rejection, if we wanted to perform out, uh, exact inference for hybrid models in general, this is almost always computationally hard in the formal sense. And the reason for that computational hardness is simply because uh, the, the number of discrete assignments is going to scale exponentially with the number of discrete states. And in the worst case, we have no choice but to essentially explore that state space. So existing techniques uh, are often either computationally intractable, but maybe they can offer guarantees, for example, by uh, trying to explore this, this entire space, um, or they're forced to simplify somehow. And so, and for example, this could be um, by pruning the hypothesis space in some way. And actually the method that um, that uh, Frank is, is alluding to on uh, his post, the MHISAM2 method, uh, which is very cool work by uh, Michael Case's group, uh, does uh, essentially exactly that. It, it attempts to prune this discrete uh, hypothesis space. But uh, the key consequence of um, the difficulty of, of exact inference in this, in this uh, context is that existing techniques typically trade off efficiency for robustness. And I particularly like this quote from Chris Atkinson, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he asked us once after, after a talk, uh, it really stuck with me and, and uh, influenced, I think, a lot of the, the ideas uh, that I worked on during my PhD. And he said, uh, referring to, to SLAM systems in particular, he said, these systems have the property that the more they know, which is the bigger the maps are, the stupider and slower they get. And that's troubling. So how do you deal with that? Uh, and this is, I think, an interesting uh, question to consider in light of these sorts of hybrid estimation problems. So to address this, uh, in our work, which we call DCSAM, uh, we developed a set of general purpose tools for representing hybrid models in terms of factor graphs. And we also propose an efficient algorithm for solving these sorts of hybrid estimation problems. And then uh, to cap it off in this presentation, I'll cover a novel semantic slam system that we developed that leverages some of these ideas and the tools that we, um, that we um, built in, in our uh, DCSAM library uh, to, uh, to do some cool uh, object-based navigation. So in, in particular, this uh, DCSAM library, which stands for Discrete Continuous Smoothing and Mapping, is written in C++ and it extends the GTSAM library to the setting of uh, hybrid factor graphs. It also incorporates uh, as sort of a default optimization technique, 
our uh, op the optimization method that we that we developed that I'll, I'll um, talk in, in detail about here. The library that we developed, uh, and I think this is also important, um, is easily extensible. So you can easily model new problems, uh, you know, not necessarily semantic slam, for example, um, or build new hybrid optimization methods uh, using a unified underlying representation. So even if you didn't want to use our optimizer, like say you wanted to develop your own optimizer, um, you can write a different optimization technique that ingests as, as input the same factor graph that another method uh, takes as input. And this is really cool because it actually allows you to compare, for example, how different optimizers would perform on the exact same problem in a way that wasn't really possible um, before without writing, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it wasn't possible, but rather wasn't really convenient. Um, because if you wanted to use multiple different techniques for doing hybrid optimization in this setting before, you'd ultimately end up writing a lot of sort of middleware code just to interact with different solution methods. And so what's nice about this is you can sort of write down one factor graph model and then optimize it 10 different ways and see what works best. Uh, of course, right now we only have one, one optimizer, uh, but it would be very interesting to think about you know, trying different optimization techniques uh, in this context. Okay, so how do we actually solve these optimization problems? Because I've just, I've just kind of laid out why this is so challenging. Um, how do we actually do it? Ah, I see, uh, we have a, sorry, we have a question in the chat. Um, what does stupider for a large map imply? Is it like large error gain or it stops using history after a certain point? Um, let me think about that. Um, I think uh, oh, so. So maybe to 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 backtrack. Um, let's see. Ah, stupider. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I had to think about that for a second. Um, so what Chris is saying here, when when he says the stupider and slower they get, um, what he means is that uh, the um, these the performance of these methods is is uh, getting worse as these maps scale. Um, meaning you're more likely to see, for example, a, um, an error, small or large, in your map um, for uh, the bigger the map is. And by bigger, the, we're really using bigger, the, the, the bigger the map as a, as a, a proxy for um, longer duration operation, typically. Um, so it, it is uh, essentially exactly like you said. Um, you'll see larger errors. Um, both larger accumulated errors or a higher likelihood of, of dramatic errors uh, as the maps become larger, as duration of operation becomes longer. Maybe that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, related yes. to that stupidity question, um, uh, can we also say that we, we expect we add more information, things should get better, but it doesn't most of the time. It just doesn't, and that's very disappointing. Yes, that, that's, that's a, a wonderfully concise way of, of putting it. Um, yeah, uh, it's exactly that. We, more measurements should make your state estimate better. It should make navigation easier. But in, in, in fact, in practice, what we often see is the opposite, that the more measurements you have, the more likely you are to encounter unmodeled errors. And those unmodeled errors are likely to corrupt your state estimate significantly. Um, so as our robots navigate longer, collect more measurements, this is, this is troublesome. And we'd like it to be the opposite, right? We'd, we'd like to get to the point where, where we can fully realize the benefits of, of having more measurements. And, and one more question here. Our, I mean, there's a historical reason for it, but I remember a time that Everybody in SLAM and estimation, they, they, they had to implement their own solver. They refused to use any off the shelf um, optimizer. Whereas in, in, let's say, control community, it was all about using an off the shelf solver. You, you had to just formulate your problem. Uh, do you think you know, it's time to port our SLAM libraries as an option to? professional solvers. What do you mean by professional solvers? You know, a lot of people, for example, work on um, 
um, control multi agent system, they might use Groovy or some oh. solvers that, you know, it's a mixed integer program. You just program it and you're done. Or it's a convex yeah. program, you're done. They it's lack a lot of the solvers that we want, for example, the one you develop. Mm. But we yeah. still are very disconnected from those libraries. I think that there's there's maybe two things to say there. Um, one is that I think that commercial solvers don't naturally provide support for a lot of things that are useful for folks who work on perception and estimation. Um, for example, at least in the, on the research side of things, um, if you're doing things that are a little more tried and true, like if you're doing extended Kalman filters or something like that, um, it can be, there are tools that exist that have been in circulation for a long time that you can probably pull and, you know, use things like that. But if you're doing research, um, there aren't, I think, as many tools or as good support from, say, commercial libraries for, for um, you know, say, uh, doing like factor graph, like doing optimization for um, an objective function that's parameterized by a factor graph. And we'd like to do dynamic updates to that factor graph. We'd like to do incremental inference. All of the things that sort of pop up in, in a context, which I guess you might consider relatively niche in the grand scheme of things, like, you know, we want real-time online performance out of our state estimators often. And that's maybe a requirement that's not always true of other um, of other domains. Controls, I think, is, is a good example of, of a domain where um, it's it's clear that that those problems are important enough that it, it was worth a dedicated effort to to develop really good commercial tools. Maybe Slam will get there. I don't know. I, it's hard for me to, to, to say. I mean, it's clear that, that these types of problems are important, right? Um, the, the second thing that, that I would say um, is that for, for the case of factor graph, for the case of, of factor graph specifically, I think that there's, there's definitely an interesting trade-off between using an existing tool for um, you know, being able to write down your factor graph in a, in a relatively general way um, and then just you know, solve it versus I want something more performant and so I'm going to develop specialized tooling for the, to solve a particular problem that I that I have. You know, maybe if I, you know working in a company or something like that, maybe there's a very specific type of slam problem you have. You don't necessarily need to the entire GT SAM stack or something like that to to or you know the entire power of factor graphs, but maybe you can write just a fixed lag smoother. And you don't even need to necessarily reason explicitly in your mind about the fact that there's a, a factor graph under the hood. Um, but you know, really there 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 is. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. But I guess what I'm saying is um, there's there's a tooling question here, which is, you know, should we use these sort of commercial solvers or, or you know, that kind of thing. But, but there's also a question of, we can still use, uh, I, I guess that there, there's also a question of, of translating the factor graph as a modeling tool to software, which I think is actually maybe, um, you don't necessarily, what I'll say is, I guess, you don't necessarily need all of the software tooling to implement all of the different features that factor graphs can afford, um, even though, even if your problem is is nicely parameterized by a factor graph, so long as say you, you know you have a, a particular you know maybe like a specialized like a particular problem of interest, um, so it may be worth it. Like in the context of DC SAM, maybe this is this will this will ground my response uh, better. Like it's not necessarily important that you use. I'm not, I'm not, for example, concerned if people use our library DC SAM. I think that the important insight um, and the insight of our technical approach that, that I'm going to go into is to write down the, the problem clearly in terms of a factor graph model. And then you can go from there. You can see if there's any sort of special structure that you can leverage when it comes to implementing the software or the, you know, the underlying algorithms to, to solve that problem. So at the end of the day, it's like write down the model and then figure out all the, the, the software stuff. Um, the goal with the DC SAM thing is really, uh, and similar to, to things like GTSAM, uh, is really to provide a, a fairly general interface, which would be useful to, um, I guess, research practitioners mainly, um, who might be, you know, who's, who might have a changing problem specification. Thank you. No problem. That was a great question. All right. Um, so, okay. So I've kind of laid out, you know, that this, this is a hard problem, right? Um, so how do we actually solve this? Uh, the, the sort of insight that we leverage in our uh, solver that's implemented in, in DC SAM is that while these problems are often generally computationally hard, 
It turns out that they often split into subproblems, which are easily solved. Uh, and specifically, they're, they're, these subproblems uh, can be formed based on the conditional independence structure um, that appears in the factor graph model. So for example, an easy way to see this is, uh, I think, probably clear in, in the second example of outlier rejection. Um, and so what we like about one, one particular thing that we like about factor graphs is that we know that if we say, um, if we consider, say, these two discrete states in red, there is no path from one of these discrete states in the, uh, through, through the graph to the other that does not go through any continuous state. And so if we happen to know an assignment to these continuous states, inference over the remaining uh, discrete states becomes fully decoupled. And this is nice because this actually now splits into actually um, independent subproblems that we can solve. And so here, uh, if this, if, you know, if we're interested in um, inlier outlier decisions, say, now this this problem, which was which was quite difficult to solve, uh, you know, because it involved reasoning about all pairs of of, uh, of inlier outlier decisions, and you can imagine in practice we often have far more than two. Um, now we can actually just solve each of these uh, inlier outlier decisions totally separate. In the case of the switching system, we see a kind of different story. And so it's not actually obvious immediately why this might be uh, advantageous. But here, conditioning on the continuous states, the subgraph over the discrete states uh, is simply a chain. And we happen to know uh, that in the case of a chain, the general algorithm for, for exact inference in discrete factor graphs, called max product elimination, simplifies to what's known as the Viterbi algorithm, which maybe you've seen in class or something like that, um, which uh, it happens to be a polynomial time algorithm, which means that this discrete subproblem solve step can be performed in polynomial time, even though inference over the uh, joint inference over the whole um, uh, factor graph uh, is worst case exponential time. And this is also for, for these particular cases. I'll, I'll go into a little bit more of the you know, sort of analysis of the the computational complexity of doing this um, a little later. But it turns out we can play this game the other, in the other direction as well. If we fix an assignment to the discrete states, we can always optimize the continuous states efficiently. Uh, and so in the case where our measurements admit a linear model, this might involve convex optimization, or in the more common case of nonlinear measurement models, we would simply take a, a step using the, a trust region method. And so if we consider this um, probability distribution over the continuous states conditioned on the measurements and an assignment to the discrete states, this would involve essentially computing a, a gradient of this, um, of this uh, probability and taking a step in the direction of that gradient in the, in the most, in the, in the loosest possible uh, uh, um, case. And of course, we don't actually know the correct assignment for the continuous and, and the discrete states. Uh, so it may not be immediately obvious how, you know, why this would be useful. Uh, because if we happen to know that all, all off the bat, the correct assignment for continuous and discrete states, we would just be done. We would have the solution to our problem. Uh, but we can leverage this idea in any case. And so the way, the way that we'll do this is essentially by supplying an initial guess to the continuous states, which here is denoted as CI. And the way to visualize this is that the sort of X and Y axes of this plot are giving us the uh, continuous state space and the Z axis, which just has values maybe at like you could say zero or one um, for two possible assignments. Uh, the Z axis corresponds to an assignment to a single discrete state. So this would be for a factor graph with two continuous states and a single discrete state. And what I'm plotting here is just uh, the value of the joint probability uh, where darker blue is higher probability and, and uh, going all the way to red for uh, low probability. So here, if we supply an initial guess, which is now uh, and sort of just an xy coordinate uh, given by ci, what we're going to do is, is solve for the optimal assignment to the discrete variables conditioned on this estimate for the continuous variables. And so here, uh, it may be a little hard to see from this, but because this uh, this upper plot has a, a darker blue, uh, we conclude that, that um, the higher probability um, assignment to the discrete states is to set d to 1 here. So that'll be our di plus 1. And then uh, given our update to the continuous states, uh, we, we will solve for the, uh, sorry, given, given our, our, our update to the discrete states, we'll solve for the continuous states. And so here, the way to see this is that now we're, we, we live in this sort of top plot. And we'd like to now compute a gradient with respect to this contour. 
uh, take a step in that direction, and then that gives us ci plus one. And it's important to note that, that you don't actually need to uh, compute the precise maximizer in each of these subproblems. Um, in fact, to guarantee that you're never going to make the cost of the solution worse, uh, it suffices to say that each of these subproblems doesn't make the, the cost of a solution worse. So in other words, uh, when we update the, the discrete states, we don't ever go to an assignment to the discrete states um, that is not as good as the current assignment. And likewise, if we use something like a trust region method for the continuous states and we can guarantee that we take a descent step, um, that's enough to, to guarantee that this overall procedure uh, never makes the, the solution worse. And a lot of you will have actually seen this idea in practice before. So uh, the iterative closest point method, which maybe you've covered it in, in, in class uh, as well, uh, is probably the most popular algorithm for solving the point cloud registration problem. Uh, and this essentially proceeds by positing an initial guess for the unknown relative transform between two point clouds. And then we're going to use that to determine an estimate for the correspondences between the points in each cloud. And then we rinse and repeat this process. And the cost function for this is depicted on, on the right here. Uh, and this should be minimization over uh, not just a, uh, a rigid body transform in SE3, but also the correspondence variables here, DI. So this should be a joint minimization, not minimization of just the, the, the pose. Now, it turns out that if you encode, if you, if you simply you know, write out the, the graphical structure of this objective function, you get a factor graph that looks like this, where the discrete states are those decision variables in red, uh, the correspondence decisions. And this single continuous variable is the rigid body transform from one cloud to the other. And then each measurement, which is each term in this summation, uh, is one of these factors. And so ICP, or, or iterative closest point, will, will just perform alternating optimization on this objective function, right? Um, but this is also exactly the algorithm that uh, DCSAM employs. And so if we, it turns out that if we, uh, if we program up this uh, factor graph using DCSAM, and then hit optimize. What we get are exactly the results that ICP would give, because mathematically this is this is equivalent to uh, running an iterative closest point in this case. And so these are actually results from running effectively ICP by way of of DCSAM on the top. And this is the Stanford Dragon data set. And here I'm just showing five iterations of optimization, where in between each iteration uh, we're doing a continuous step and a discrete step. And you can see that you know we get pretty reasonable results uh, where you know initially we have these two separate red and, and blue point clouds and then they converge to something that looks pretty reasonable. Uh, this is obviously like a you know very easy sort of case. Uh, this is there's nothing special about this ICP. This is like the most basic ICP implementation you could possibly have, um, but it, it I think gives it a different view on on the the sort of optimization technique itself which is that you can kind of think about this loosely as a, a, a generalization of the idea behind um, ICP to arbitrary factor graph topologies. So all you have to do as a practitioner is encode this factor graph, and then you can hit solve, and you're effectively getting you know, the behavior that, that um, we would get out of something like ICP. And the really nice thing about this approach, which I think has been observed by folks who have been doing point cloud registration for a long time, is that it easily scales often to many thousands of discrete variables without any need to prune discrete assignments. And so here uh, I'm showing that using a very simple conditional Gaussian mixture outlier model, we can achieve competitive performance on a robust slam task while being faster than a state-of-the-art approach based on graduated non-convexity. And so specifically here, we're trying to estimate the trajectory of a robot um, sort of, uh, I guess, a, a sort of simulated robot that's that's navigating around on, on a sphere. But a subset of the measurements are contaminated by outliers. And so here we have uh, 2,500, about 2,500 um, discrete variables that simply control, uh, in a binary fashion, decisions about whether measurements should be treated as inliers and kept in, in, in the optimization or treated as outliers. And uh, they're still kept in the optimization, but, but um, modeled with a very, very large variance. So almost effectively uh, um, removed from the optimization procedure. And you can see across the top here that in, in just a few iterations, our method recovers a, a pretty reasonable solution. These red uh, lines are, are outlier measurements, and then in blue are the inliers. Um, and then here you can see you know, our, our approach is giving very, uh, very good performance in terms of error. Um, this LM approach is just a standard levenberg markov um, optimizer that, that has all of the outliers in the graph. So uh, we've this, this is doing no uh, reasoning about inlier outliers. And then here you can see the time uh, on, the, on the time plot. 
what you find is that our method in, in, in Red here uh, is about as fast as, as just the vanilla sort of continuous optimization technique that doesn't reason at all about outliers, but ours is also uh, you know, keeping track of these inlier outlier decisions. And part of the reason for this is that um, by making good decisions about measurements that are inliers and outliers during the course of navigation, um, the sort of overall cost landscape seems to be a little less chaotic than when you have tons and tons of outliers in the optimization process. Okay, so I mentioned I would come back to this. Um, when is our solver uh, actually efficient? Because I said some, you know, I, I made all these claims about sort of uh, computational complexity of different parts of this problem. How does that maybe generalize? Uh, so specifically, our solver, as as it is currently implemented, is efficient when conditioning on continuous variables creates small or sparsely connected sets of discrete variables. Because really, as I kind of uh, mentioned before, it's this discrete subgraph that's contributing to the computational complexity of this problem. If the discrete subgraph is densely connected, global inference is just going to be hard. Uh, so if you had, say, like a single variable, uh, single factor that's connected to all of your discrete variables and you had a whole bunch of discrete variables, um, then in that sort of factor graph topology, uh, it's it's going to be quite hard to find. Uh, um, even uh, I should say, in that sort of factor graph topology, even the discrete subproblem optimization step will be hard. Um, however, uh, there's there's sort of a, a a way that we can we can get around this, which is that in the current implementation, we're uh, solving for the optimal discrete assignments conditioned on uh, a, a a set of continuous states. But we don't need to do that. We can apply local optimization, just like how we take gradients uh, with respect to continuous variables when we when we're doing uh, local optimization. We can apply similar techniques like coordinate ascent or, or descent to the the discrete subproblem. And as I said, all we need is improvement in the subproblems to guarantee uh, improvement in the joint assignment, or at least that we don't make uh, solutions worse, I should say. Uh, and then that leads to another interesting question, which is when can this method guarantee good solutions? And we can't. Generally, we can't, uh, is, is uh, sort of the, the answer in a nutshell. And it's, it's a simple fact that even in vanilla, what, what I'll call vanilla slam, meaning just uh, continuous only slam problems, uh, we typically solve these problems using local optimization methods that don't have the ability to make guarantees on their performance, except in some restricted cases, under uh, you know uh, restricted noise models, say, um, and that kind of thing. Um, but in the most general case, uh, we we don't have those sorts of guarantees. And and of course, because our uh, our approach is uh, ha has vanilla slam as a special case, we you know we can't do any better than that. Um, and so the takeaway really is that in order for our approach to succeed, we, we crucially need a good initial guess, just like uh, when we're solving um, you know, vanilla slam problems. Uh, of course, in these types of hybrid estimation problems, it may be the case that it's a lot harder to supply a good initial guess, right? And so in the future, I think some interesting things to consider uh, might be, for example, blending the sort of local optimization procedure that we developed with globalization approaches, like search or like uh, different annealing procedures and things like that uh, to try to either mitigate sensitivity to the initial guess or at least to explore the, the sort of uh, landscape of, of possible solutions better than supplying a single initial guess. And then uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll mention um, just briefly for folks who might be interested um, why or where would I use DCSAM in, in my own research? If you're, you know, a practitioner who's who's interested in maybe trying out DCSAM or something like that, um, why might you use this? I think uh, from the solver side, DCSAM is cool uh, because it allows for efficient in incremental inference. And I haven't mentioned this, but I'll talk a little bit more about this actually in the in the back half of the talk. Um, partly, the the reason that that we're able to achieve efficient incremental inference is because uh, by separating these problems, we're able to leverage all existing tooling for uh, solving continuous estimation subproblems. So you may have heard of things like ISAM or ISAM2. Uh, we, we can just simply use those tools for solving a continuous estimation subproblem. Uh, DZSAM allows you to Im easily implement backends for things like semantic mapping, localization, SLAM, robust SLAM, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to do things like combine uh, learned category level factors like shape priors with geometric information in a streamlined manner. You could do all kinds of cool stuff like this just using our solver uh, uh, off the bat. But I think more generally, if you're interested in our library, uh, 
DCSAM provides a natural framework to implement new sort of hybrid optimization tools. They're not necessarily in SLAM or Perception. So these could be uh, Monte Carlo methods like um, uh, Monte Carlo tree search or um, simulated annealing or more vanilla tree search like branch and bound type methods. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is cool because it enables side-by-side -side comparison of different hybrid backend optimization techniques uh, that all can take in the same input. Um, so I, I want to, uh, maybe in the, in the interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, quickly go through the sort of last bit of the talk, which is um, about how we develop a uh, semantic slam approach using these techniques, and then maybe take questions at the end. OK, so uh, how do we apply this to the case of, of semantic slam or object-based slam? Um, so in, in the most basic case where we know the correspondence between uh, our measurements, in this case, object detections, and uh, landmarks in the environment, we have a single hypothesis about correspondences uh, for each measurement that our, our robot has made. And then in this case, we just need to estimate the robot's trajectory, the landmark locations, and then the discrete uh, classes of, of each landmark. And just out of the box, you can use DCSAM to, to attack problems like this. But as we saw, assuming data association is uh, correct and, and known when it's not can lead to navigation failures. So uh, this is uh, calling back to you know, the first example I showed where you know, object, detect uh, uh, object detectors might perform erratically. Uh, and then what do we do when, when outliers pop up in our sort of factor graphs? Okay, we can relax the assumption of known data association by simply adding a discrete association variable to the problem, assuming that we have a reasonable set of candidate landmarks. And in DCSAM, once again, this is easy to do because we can just throw on another discrete state. Uh, we add it to our factor graph, we write a different factor type um, that reasons about this sort of ambiguity, and we're good to go. And given that, we can sort of write down this whole semantic slam problem in terms of a hybrid estimation problem. Uh, where we wanted to find now the most probable set of robot poses, semantic landmarks, which could, in our case, uh, just consider, uh, we, we consider just a position in 3D space and a semantic class from a known set of classes, uh, and data association variables, these discrete variables indicating correspondences between each measurement and a landmark in the environment. And then in this work, we're going to use odometry measurements between subsequent uh, robot poses and object detections from a uh, stereo camera. Though the approach that I'm going to describe isn't really restricted to this configuration, it's just what we, you know, what we used for this. And the way that this works uh, is that when a new measurement arrives, we simply decide whether it corresponds to a new landmark or a known landmark. And the way that we do this is uh, using a threshold on the measurement likelihood, the probability of this measurement given our map, um, to determine whether this landmark is, is most likely to be new or uh, previously in our map. And if it's new, this is easy. We just add it to our map. We initialize it using the value of the measurement um, and the class measured from an object detector. Uh, and on the other hand, if we determine that uh, our measurement corresponds to one of the known landmarks, there might still be ambiguity as to which of the known landmarks is correct. And so in this case, rather than selecting a single or most likely association, uh, we're, going to main, we're going to maintain multiple hypotheses. And finally, we can account for potential false positives within this framework by just allowing for a null hypothesis decision, which just like in the outlier rejection case, this is going to essentially reject the measurement as an outlier. Um, and the way that we model this is just as a Gaussian with a large variance. And it turns out that we can play another trick here, which is to actually represent these hypotheses implicitly uh, without the need to explicitly keep track of, of uh, these discrete data association variables. And so uh, given the set of data association hypotheses, uh, we can actually marginalize out that association variable to get an equivalent problem defined, defined over only robot poses and landmarks, including the landmark position and the class. And so the technical details here aren't tremendously important, but uh, the, the key benefit of this is that we've now dramatically reduced the number of discrete variables that we actually have to keep around in the optimization procedure, which is uh, computational convenience. And now to test this out, we recorded a data set of about 30 minutes uh, of, of, of data using an MIT race car ground robot, which was equipped with a stereo camera for odometry and for uh, object detections. Our object detections are sort of simulated. We put up around uh, 200 April tag fiducials at MIT. And those fiducials allowed us to determine the correct data associations, first of all, uh, but also uh, to, to essentially simulate um, semantic classes. And the way that we do this is we take 
the known uh, identifier of each uh, fiducial. And we say, you know, uh, take the identifier number modulo two to simulate a two class uh, semantic slam problem. And in this, in this uh, example, we're also simulating a 10% misclassification rate. So 10% of the time, we're actually switching the label on the robot. Um, so it's, it's, getting, uh, it's getting these labels wrong 10% of the time. But that incorrect class is still going into the navigation system. And we also add additional odometry noise. Uh, and so on these artificial semantic slam systems, our approach, which is uh, depicted in these two trajectories on the right, uh, outperformed the sort of single hypothesis baseline, this maximum likelihood method in the center, which creates two hallways. It's maybe a little hard to see. Um, and so this was a little bit, you know, this was pretty encouraging for uh, the application of, of these sort of ideas. Um, so we, we tried it out on some, some real data. And here we're operating on uh, benchmark data from, from the Kitty data set. And here, uh, this is maybe not how you'd want your autonomous car to navigate, but we're using cars as landmarks for navigation. Uh, and this can, of course, be challenging because cars move, and we're not actually modeling the dynamics of cars at all. So if there, are, if there happen to be moving cars in the data set, these end up being modeled as outliers, which is kind of an additional challenge to our, our method. And what you can see is that the maximum likelihood approach quickly fails uh, once even a few incorrect data associations are, are made. And then in contrast, our methods, which are on the, the bottom right and the, and the middle here, um, produce reasonable trajectory estimates, even despite noise and detections and a few moving landmarks in this environment. And finally, here's just a more recent version of our system. Uh, this is all running in in, uh, in DC SAM. The older methods that the, the older uh, videos that, that I showed uh, were before we we moved to using DC SAM for everything. But this this is kind of the nicer version of everything, um, running on a, a larger Kitty odometry sequence. Um, and here we're using both cars and trucks to navigate. Uh, so one of the one of the cool advances that we made when we moved to using DC SAM for everything was it just became easier to model these sorts of problems with uh, different types of objects and, and that kind of stuff. OK, so uh, just to summarize, uh, in this work, I uh, tried to address the question of essentially how to efficiently represent and solve hybrid estimation problems. And the specific contributions included a general purpose library for modeling and solving these problems, DC SAM. Uh, and in turn, uh, we developed a new semantic SLAM system that leverages some of these ideas. Uh, I didn't go into it uh, today, really, uh, but our paper on DC SAM uh, discusses incremental, the, the, the issue of incremental inference that I kind of alluded to earlier, um, but didn't go into detail about. Um, and also approximate marginal computations, which are also provided by our library um, and actually crucial for getting the sort of uh, semantic slam system that, that I showed working. Um, and then the overall technical punchline here is uh, essentially that leveraging problem structure that's exposed by factor graph models is really key to achieving efficient inference. Uh, and as I was kind of uh, uh, touching on before, this insight is really more about factor graphs than it is about software, right? The software tooling is, is a convenience and, and it's important from a practitioner's perspective. But at the end of the day, the, the key technical insight is that uh, when we actually model these problems using factor graphs, the specific structures that arise in the, the types of practical perception and navigation um, problems that we're interested in are, make it advantageous to consider uh, inference techniques like alternating optimization. And I'll speak very briefly about sort of future work kind of stuff and ongoing things. Uh, just some things that, that I think are kind of interesting. I'm happy to comment more about these. These are sort of high level. Um, but I think some, some interesting avenues for future work on these topics would be in developing more expressive hybrid models for perception. So this includes things like richer object models that might combine inference uh, over objects shape as well as the category. So you, know, you might know um, from an object classification, uh, you know, if I know that a particular type of object and then I have some uh, limited information about the geometry of that object, say from a single view, uh, like if I have a partial view of a chair or something like that, but I also have a classification that says that this object is a chair, that can actually inform things like, you know, the structure of the object that isn't in view, the structure of the parts of the, of the objects that are not in view. Uh, and you can imagine that, that trying to write this down in general is maybe a little bit tricky, but, but if you can start to model the individual components, Tools like DCSAM uh, could be 
useful for for uh, elegantly combining these sort of otherwise disparate sources of information. And the second point is dealing with abstraction and hierarchy. So we've already seen a lot of uh, cool work come out recently on the topic of uh, 3D scene graphs. You can imagine trying to combine these sort of like hybrid factor graph models with scene graph models, um, you know, making decisions like, is this a place? Is this not a place? You could incorporate those sort of discrete states in your, in your factor graph. Um, this is an interesting thing to think about. And then finally, and I think this is like, uh, you know, especially at, at this particular moment, very interesting, uh, grounding language models in, in scene geometry somehow. So there's been all of this very exciting work in the context of, of uh, language models. And people are starting to think, it seems, about how we can uh, take advantage of those ideas in the context of uh, perception, mapping, navigation, uh, that kind of thing. Um, it could be interesting to think about how how these sort of hybrid factor graph tools could be used in that context. I don't have very strong ideas or, or opinions in, the, in that space, but it seems like something that's worth thinking about. Excuse me. And then as a last sort of uh, thought, um, this is based on some recent work from, from my lab mate, uh, uh, Zichi Liu. Here, uh, we're essentially taking some of these ideas about building object-based maps and using them actually for self-supervised uh, learning or semi-supervised learning, you might call it. Um, so in, in this case, uh, we're essentially using a, a, an off-the-shelf uh, 6D object pose estimator to build a, um, an object-level scene map by way of, of robust optimization techniques that do things like reason about outliers, uh, et cetera. And then we feed this object level scene map back uh, into the, the uh, neural network, the 60 object pose estimator, uh, as training, essentially. Uh, and so leveraging these, these, um, these object level scene maps, we can generate multi, uh, essentially multi-view consistent, uh, what, what we might call pseudo ground truth labels for robot collected images and then use this as, as new training data to fine tune the estimator. And we found uh, this to be particularly useful for, for um, taking an off the shelf object pose estimator that's trained on you know, not your data uh, and then fine tuning it for data that you happen to have on hand. And this of course can be done nice, uh, this, this is cool because it can be done you know, you don't, without say a motion capture or without ground truth about the objects, you simply run a slam system, right? So all you need is a camera to do this, which is very cool. And so lastly, uh, I'd just like to you know, acknowledge uh, some of the people who, who made this work possible, uh, including uh, in, uh, folks who, who worked on, on um, the sort of initial versions of some of this work, and then, and then folks who have been working on ongoing uh, versions of this work, including David Baxter, Eddie Schneeweiss, Zichi Liu, Karen Singh, uh, uh, Carol Jahui uh, Fu, um, Chang Chang Huang, uh, Tonio Turan, David Rosen, and, and of course, John Leonard, uh, and I'll thank our, our sponsors, uh, the Office of Naval Research and, and uh, NSF. And with that, I'll take any questions that folks might have. I think we have a, a good amount of time for, for questions. Thank you, Kevin. The great talk and ideas. Um, can I have a question? Hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, as far as, can you go back to the technical stuff? The um, I think the optimization, the slide. Sure. Are you uh, thinking of this slide? Um, yes. So you said that we can use Viterbi algorithm to solve the first oh. problem because it's discrete one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and do we have the assumption of uh, Markov? Do we have the Markov assumption in this, um, in this sub problem when we're solving the Viterbi algorithm? Yeah, so you can see this happening, right? Um, essentially, that, that when when you have a, a so maybe this is subtle. Um, yeah, what we have here, uh, this is I, I think yeah many people maybe haven't been exposed to this, but but one way of thinking about this conditional subgraph is that you can think of there just being essentially a factor here, a factor here, a factor here, a factor here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, yeah, I can see that. And then imagine there's just nothing here. There's, there are no continuous states anymore, but, but all of these edges have just been replaced by a single factor. And that is exactly what a, a, uh, a hidden Markov model would look like, right? Yes. A, a discrete factor graph with, with a factor on each of these nodes. And then 
uh, or factor node attached to each of these nodes, and then a factor node linking each of these nodes. And so that's exactly what's going on. Uh, sort of, it, I guess, um, you could think of there being a maybe an implied sort of Markov uh, behavior going on, right? That this yeah. this state here is conditionally independent of this state here on the, uh, this first state, given this intermediary state. Okay, so um, why if there are some dependency of um, previous several steps, can we can we solve that problem, or do we have a solver for that kind of problem? Yes, that's a wonderful question. So. Um, so getting back to what I was saying about sort of when our method is sufficient, if you have that type of multi, uh, I don't know the, the right way to, maybe non-Markov uh, is the right way to describe it, that type of dependency across multiple states, you can still solve that problem using our method. Our, our method in, uh, uses max product elimination to, to solve this discrete subproblem. Yeah. The caveat being, if this uh, discrete subgraph is complicated, there, we make no promises about when that when you're going to get a solution, right? Uh, so if this is a particularly complicated discrete subgraph, max product elimination is in general an exponential time algorithm. And so if, if, because we are actually trying to solve for the optimal assignment to discrete states conditioned on continuous states, uh, you may you may be you may be waiting a while for uh, more complicated discrete factor graph topologies. It happens that this was enough for the types of cases that we are interested in. For example, um, semantic slam, outlier rejection, all of these these cases. Um, break up in a nice enough way that, that we don't have to worry about the fact that we're using technically an exact inference method for discrete optimization here, uh, or for the discrete factor graph subproblem. But if you have a more complicated topology and you're concerned about time, which you probably would be in that case, um, as, I, as I kind of uh, mentioned, you can swap out max product elimination for a different technique like coordinate ascent, say, uh, for discrete states that is more computationally efficient. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Isaac. Of course, then you're you you might be sacrificing things in terms of performance. But what can you do? Uh, in you know, in, in the context of some of those problems, they're they're incredibly computationally challenging to solve. So, we have a question in chat. Sure. Uh, not sure if it's for Elon Musk or you, but you can try. Uh, how do you th how, how how do you think Tesla's pure vision driver assistance system that relies entirely on the camera? Interesting. What do you think about it? And that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't have strong opinions about it. I guess. Uh, I guess is the, is the is the question whether or not I think that's a good idea, or I I, I think I don't have a strong opinion about it. Probably you could you could say uh, maybe uh, I can reframe the question. Do you, do you think the vision only system um, is is a good solution because the a sense of factor graph and what we cover in uh, basically robot perception is the multi sensor fusion. Right. I see. The I see. Redundancy of the sensory input in, in the robot. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a that's a good point. Um, yeah. So certainly I think from a from a sort of engineering standpoint, I think you know redundancy is is good. Uh, I think it's good to to combine information from multiple sources, you know, from multiple sensors where possible. Uh, the details about how that happens are are always challenging, um, but I think if if we can figure it out, it's probably worthwhile as opposed to to relying on a single uh, sensing modality. I have a question about these variables. Uh... Are the discrete variables always binary, or they can be any integer? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so yeah, in the semantic slam case, um, like I know I I like I only I only talked about um, two classes uh, in our semantic slam experiments. We've done we've done things with more than more than two classes, especially uh, using the the April tags in this sort of like simulated example that I showed. It's very easy to model different numbers of classes and we've done this. So so in our uh, software, I mean, I would say both algorithmically or in terms of the math um, and then also in the actual implementation, there's um, there's nothing that's constraining you to to deal with specifically binary variables mm -hmm. versus, um, you know, any other um, type of discrete state. And, and a follow up question, how, how bad can we initialize these categories? Essentially, if you make it random, mm -hmm. it will be Basically unsupervised. Does it work? Uh, not necessarily. So to give, 
I don't have a good I don't have a good picture for this, but um, because it would be very extreme, very so difficult. For, Right. So, so an example of how that might show up is if you were to say, initialize, like if you initialize like a, a robust slam problem and you take a whole bunch of the outliers and you initialize them and you say, all of these outliers are actually inlier measurements, then you're giving, you're essentially just going to end up with a, a horrendous initial guess, right? Um, and it seems very likely, like even, even in the, in the case where you, you, um, even in, I would say, like traditional slam applications, if you start with a poor initial guess like that, you're not guaranteed to get good solutions. I would imagine that if you did something, if you started with, say, random discrete variables, in this case, uh, that would be pretty bad. What we usually do is not initialize the discrete states, though. Because uh, we solve the discrete problem, uh, because we're using max product elimination to solve the discrete problem, we're getting an optimal solution to this conditional subproblem. So we actually don't have to initialize the, in our, in this specific case, we don't have to initialize the discrete states at all. What we do instead is we initialize the continuous states. Mm. And this is typically, a, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this with an asterisk. This is typically much easier because we can initialize the continuous states from something like odometric estimates or something like that. Um, and as long as that initial guess for the continuous states is, is uh, relatively good, we can we can bootstrap this discrete solve process um, and uh, and obtain good solutions. Um, of course, if you have you know if a substantial propor uh, portion of your measurements are corrupted by outliers, uh, this can be very hard to do. If you if you like a good example of, of a, a case where this is particularly tricky is in the case of like multiple robots where you're mm -hmm. trying to reason about inliers and outliers in loop closures between different robots and you have no um, common reference frame for these robots otherwise, right? This is like a challenge that's addressed by like pairwise consistent measurement maximization um, and things like that. But uh, the issue here is that we, we don't have an initial guess for each of the robots trajectories in a common reference frame. And so it's very hard to bootstrap the, the DC SAM optimization process uh, there. But what you can do, and this is something that I think is very exciting, um, I don't know that I've talked to anyone really, that I, I've talked like publicly about this before or anything like that, but I think it'd be a really cool idea to initialize the, the, the uh, DC SAM optimization procedure using something like pairwise consistent measurement maximization, right? That you can use to give an initial set of discrete assignments to then solve the, con the continuous states. And then that, that gives you a way to bootstrap this whole process, which is sort of, uh, which doesn't depend on say, like having a common initialization for multiple robots in the same, uh, sorry, an initialization for multiple robots in a common reference frame. So here, here's, now that's very interesting. Here's another idea based on what you touched on, based on the three. So when you present this discrete layer, it immediately makes me think of, um, well, why stop there? You can just make a decision tree on top of this continuous variables, right? And the moment you have the decision tree, maybe you're thinking about something like branch and bound or something that you can globally actually search. It does not have to be uh, real time. It does not have to be synchronized with the continuous part. But as you move forward, you can um, continue the search for, for the you know, most promising you know, region to solve. So this is, you know, the Go ICP, for example, that's what they do. So I wonder if you, Thought about that. The problem is you have to give up the efficiency. Usually they're very slow. Right. But yeah. the conditional independence here might add something. Yeah. Uh, and there, that's that's a, a good point. And and uh, it's worth calling out, you know, methods that that are kind of going in that direction, like uh, MHI SAM2 being uh, one of them that that tries to sort of simultaneously leverage things like the conditional independence structure of the factor graph. Um, and a sort of uh, pruning-based procedure for exploring all the sort of discrete hypotheses. But then also, um, I should mention IMHS, incremental multi-hypothesis smoothing, uh, which is uh, uh, work that was uh, applied for um, for this gate estimation problem. Uh, and I think there's there's ongoing work to to get um, this sort of method into uh, GTSAM. So there's definitely folks who are working on um, on exploring those types of approaches. I think it'd be cool to, to you know, I, I don't know that we we know exactly right now what the right, what what will be 
there are so many possible variants of these types of approaches is what I'll say. And I don't think we have great direction in terms of identifying the best possible things to explore right now, because you can imagine all kinds of ways of combining you know, a branching search procedure with a local optimization procedure like the one that we you know, employ here. Um, and you can play all kinds of games with scheduling the, you know, how you perform different types of optimization, on what time horizon are you optimizing different sets of variables. Um, I think there's a lot of room to just explore, you know, different ways of, of doing that. Um, and perhaps it'll be, you know, problem dependent at the end of the day that, that people could find, you know, different variants of these techniques that are specialized to particular tasks. But I think the nice thing, like I said, from, from maybe a, a high level sort of practical perspective is just the availability of tooling uh, to, to encode these sorts of problems, I think is a, is a useful first step in that direction. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, we have more questions from the audience. Do you label features for each landmark or just use bounding box of landmarks? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I didn't mention this. I, I, I think I just forgot to mention this, but um, in the context of our semantic slam, so, so this is regarding our, our specific semantic slam system. And the way that this works is that our, um, so, so uh, what we end up doing in the system that, that I showed is we uh, get an estimate of the position of, of each landmark, like say a car here, uh, as the, the point, uh, the, the median depth point that falls in, in this uh, bounding box. And the X, Y position is just given by the, um, the center point of, of, of the bounding box. So this is a very coarse way of, of, of estimating object locations. Um, we didn't need anything, I think to demonstrate this work, we weren't trying to do anything sort of fancy uh, with this. But in the very beginning of the, of the deck, I kind of showed uh, a sort of illustration that motivates a, a sort of alternative approach, um, which is here which is that we could actually use key points uh, that are annotated with semantic classes. And we haven't tried this, but it's a very cool idea. Um, it would slot very nicely into this sort of framework. There's no different, there would be no, you know, effectively no, um, no change to the overall formulation uh, at a high level, at least. Um, and that would be a cool thing to try. Like, you know, if you had a segmentation say, um, that would be cool. But uh, to, to maybe concretely answer the question, we use the bounding box. And then from that, we extract, we extract the um, center point uh, and the, the um, median depth of, of all of the, the points from the stereo camera that, that live in that bounding box. And that gives us our estimate of the object location. And the class just, again, comes from the detector. See any more questions? Maybe one more if anybody has any questions. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin. It's great to hear from your work and we look forward to the next back clip of uh, Boston Dynamics. <laughs> next time we will have perception probably, maybe online perception this time. For sure. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. And I'll close the session. Awesome. Thanks so much.